Today is Friday, June 27th. I'm Mitchell Englander, Chairman of the Public Safety Committee. I'm joined by my colleague, Mitchell Farrell. Good morning. Thank you for being here as well. Uh, we got a number of items for consent, but some have cards. So we'll go ahead and go through those. Um, if you don't have cards in yet and submitted, if you're here, uh, we'll close the, the submission for cards on any of the items. Most of the cards, I believe, are in. Is there anybody here that wishes to speak that has not yet filled out a card? Okay, so Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the submission for cards. On that, item one is withdrawn. So we'll go ahead and uh, receive and file. Is the speaker's card in it, I believe? Item one? Yeah. Without objection. And uh, we'll note that there was a card in for that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, but that is withdrawn. That item's withdrawn, so it's just a receiving file now. Um, on item two, um, there are no cards, and um, Mr. Rockborough cannot make it this morning. I did have the opportunity to meet with him, and uh, he's incredibly impressive. Uh, he'll make a great addition, and uh, therefore, uh, without objection, okay. we'll uh, go ahead and uh, approve him as well. Item, uh, all the cards uh, that if card cards uh, will be not noted and filed that they were already submitted. Any cards that weren't in, we've closed the submission for cards, as I've stated earlier, if you were already in the room. Item three, um, put a minute on the clock, please. We'd like to get through all the items if possible, and we have a lot of cards. We'll change it depending on the actual issue, uh, but for item three, uh, Mr. Herman, uh, we do have a card in on item three from you. Morning. Morning. Under one minute, it's I'd a like very, to bring it's a very... your attention regarding the free speech buffer zone. And this has to do with the tobacco industry manipulation of exposing our children and our health to the environment of smoking. I have asthma, I don't need to smoke, but I hang around with people who do smoke. Does that make me a criminal? No. However, there are ways to prevent our health from being affected by the cause and bad effects of any tobacco. And the Department of Education for the use of the city attorney to develop an anti-tobacco youth prevention campaign for students in Los Angeles Unified School District for the period of July 1st, 2012. This should be a continuous issue because it was you that tried to regulate the so-called e-cigarettes and then you tried to change it around and couldn't understand that. And then you went into medical marijuana. You still allowed them to go up on Cesar Chavez and violate our, our, our constitution to be free from tobacco that kills us. Thank you, Mr. Englander. If you could stay there. You've got a couple other cards, I'm sure. No, uh, I believe your only other card is general public comment. So that's Correct. okay. I'll call you back for that. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with that, uh, seeing no other cards, do you have any questions on that item? Okay, we'll go ahead and move that item as well as approved. Approval. Yes, sir. Thank you. Without objection, that'll be the order. We'll go ahead and take item four uh, for cards first. Item four, communication from the mayor and CAO relative to budget modifications and contracting authorities for the fiscal year 2012 Urban Area Security Initiative Grant Award. In addition to the mayor's report, you have a CAO report on file. Uh, yes, and uh, Ms. Ramirez, you wish to speak on that? One minute, of course. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Thank you. I'd like to know, has the grant award already been spent on the other obligations or is it being held only in case of an urban incident here in Los Angeles? And if not, I'd like you to elaborate on it. I would, um, I would like to say that first of all, we have a gang epidemic. We have a wetback infestation and crimes are not 
are, are being committed on a daily basis. We have over 11 million illegals and over 22 you can million crimes. On the subject matter. That's okay. Not the subject. Well, that is part of the subject because we are encountering security, urban security problems, and no one is telling us or no one is addressing the crimes that are being committed. So again, we have an epidemic, and again, the city council and the city attorneys have not enforced the rule of law. And therefore, I ask you, what shall good law-abiding American citizens do? And having said that, I highly recommend this movie, Blood In and Blood Out. Blood In and Blood Out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, with that, if we could, um, Mr. Bonin. Morning. Thank you. Morning. Um, and we do have uh, a quorum now, so if we can uh, reconsider the items we've already passed. And uh, without objection, it'll be uh, with the quorum. Which items is approved? Those were uh, item one was withdrawn, so it's note and file. Item two uh, was go ahead and approved Nicholas Rockfurl. Item three to accept the grant. And uh, now we're on item four. Cool. Okay. Excellent. That'll be without objection. That'll be the order. Sorry, Miss. Uh, approving item four? Um, not yet. Okay. We're going to go ahead and uh, call the department up if we can, okay. or the CAO. Whoever's got a bell, um, either put it away. Uh, it's a very quiet room, and uh, trying to hear all the conversation. We want to make sure there's no distractions. Um, I hear the bell again, and we'll ask you to step out. Thank you. Or maybe an angel got its wings. I'm not sure. Okay. With that, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, if you could just walk us through this, I do have a couple questions as it relates to the fire department enhancements, um, existing Palantir technology software, and specifically what we'll be utilizing, and uh, if you can talk about the enhancements to Firestat LA specifically. Sure. It, uh, Elisa Finson from the mayor's office. If it's okay, we'd like to call someone from the fire department. To Absolutely, of course. Chief Frazier, here. Chief Frazier, I recognize. How Good are morning. Good morning, sir. So if you could just walk us through uh, how this is going to be applied specifically using existing Palantir software within the fire department, uh, as well as uh, the enhancements to Firestat LA as the, as the father of Firestat LA. I'm always interested when I see it on an agenda. So uh, Palantir is a critical part of uh, our ability to uh, extract uh, data from uh, the uh, CAD, and that is providing us with the information for uh, Firestat. Uh, it'll also uh, be the... Uh, the foundation for uh, uh, the data that we put forward for the uh, mayor's forward-facing uh, data on fire department operations. And then it will further provide us with the ability to bring disparate data together to actually uh, uh, provide more than just uh, uh, response times uh, to the uh, to the fire stat process. Uh, we'll look at uh, such things as false alarms and uh, uh, certain aspects of uh, uh, medical responses to see if we can actually be uh, uh, forward-facing, uh, leaning forward, so to speak, uh, in the fire stat process. Is this the first time that we've actually applied um, either UASI and or any other type of grants at all to Firestat LA? No, I can speak to that. Um, I don't remember which grant year, one of the previous UASIs, there was an investment the fire department made in Palantir. So they've made a base investment. In Palantir. In Not, Palantir. Okay. Which then will enhance Firestat. Correct. Fantastic. And, um, you know, I've always been of the theory that you can't fix what you can't measure, but the measurements have to be transparent and accurate and verifiable. And so it looks like we're truly moving in that direction um, to develop the metrics to start that collaboration, and this is just another mm -hmm. um, dramatic step forward in that process. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. We're about halfway through the department, the uh, first time through, uh, looking at uh, Firestat data. Uh, and we're seeing uh, our employees, our firefighters, uh, actually engaged with the spirit Fantastic. Uh, that's being brought forward. Well, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, this will, I think, dramatically uh, overall uh, improve the, the department the capabilities, the tools, and the collaboration. Um, so I, I thank you for that as well. And if you do have phones in here, please silence them as well. Um, <clears throat> So with that, um, uh, thank you very much. This is, it's terrific, and uh, I'm glad to hear things are moving forward. 
we're aggressively, and I want to thank the mayor's office uh, for working with the CAO and the fire department, looking for additional funds outside of the city's budget, looking for grant funding to enhance uh, what we're doing within the department. And I think it's going to have long-term dramatic uh, benefits mm -hmm. that uh, those are great. So thank you, Chief. Thank you so much. Um, just another question on the um, cybersecurity platform. Again, something else that I brought forward um, to ensure that we have uh, our cyber intrusion network that's now up and running. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the mayor's office as well for the executive order uh, as the uh, author of the first motion for that and looking at a lot of the cyber um, uh, threats and uh, vulnerabilities and potential intrusions into our networks, it would be devastating to, um, uh, to, to uh, have any, anything uh, compromised. So if you can walk us through, what is this, um, the Splunk Enterprises and that security platform, what does that entail? And how sure. will that enhance the system as well? Um, again, I'd like to defer to the ITA Absolutely. Uh, department. Yeah. Morning. Good morning. How are you? Steve Brenneker, General Manager of the Information Technology Agency. The, the Splunk software is an analytic tool, so we have a bunch of security systems that are already in place in the Information Technology Agency. They create huge log files. It takes a lot of staff time to try to digest those, actually figure out what's happening. And in many cases, we use them for investigation tools as opposed to preactive tools. Mm -hmm. What the Splunk software is, it's an analytic tool that will basically create a dashboard, and in real time, it will be digesting all of those logs, and it will be providing a real-time dashboard of really what's going on in our network. We can work with our federal counterparts who post all inappropriate IPs and things that we need to watch. And so in real time, we'll actually be able to um, take a proactive measure to block streams of information that shouldn't be coming into our network and make sure that we're uh, more proactive rather than where, where we are now, which is reactive. So it'll be a very good tool for, for the Information Technology Agency, but we also believe it'll be a great tool based on this implementation to potentially take a look at it and becoming the overall security operations center uh, for all of the disparate proprietary departments as well. Terrific. Well, I, I gotta, gotta thank you for being so proactive on this and actually running with the, uh, the intrusion um, regular meetings that you're having at the Cyber Intrusion Center uh, and everything that's going on there. I mean, if you think about the vulnerabilities that we have and everything that runs on networks from our wastewater treatment, sanitation, our 911, our dispatch, our CAD systems, um, our ADSEC systems, our camera systems, I mean, everything that controls how the city functions and operates um, is susceptible. And uh, you've really been ensuring that we focus on making sure not only that are we are enhancing and improving all those networks, but that they're secure. And uh, uh, that is a huge part of public safety that, um, you know, we don't hear about uh, the grids shutting down um, and our electrical system. We don't hear about other threats and things that have happened in other jurisdictions because we've been on top of it. So again, I want to thank you as, as well as the mayor's office, and CAO's office for going after additional grant funding um, to ensure that we enhance the system. With that, uh, questions, comments, thoughts? We'll go ahead and improve this grant and thank you so much. And uh, you can hold your applause from the audience on any of these items so we can get through them as well. Thank you so much. But we'll go ahead and approve item four. Yes, sir. Uh, item five, uh, we'll go ahead and move, if we haven't moved it already, on consent. The rest of the consent items are item seven, nine, and ten. Six and eleven we have cards on. So items five, nine, ten. And seven. And uh, seven. Council members, item five has a CA report that was submitted after the publication of the agenda. Do you wish to approve that report as part of your action today? Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. That'll be the order without objection. We'll go ahead and take item six. We have a card from Ms. Ramirez. Item 6, Board of Police Commissioners report and CO2 report relative to the 2013 Port Security Grant award in the amount of $356,250 from the Department of Homeland Security for use by the LAPD. Here I have a wonderful picture of uh, Chief Charlie Beck holding the uh, mayor hostage. 
He's holding a uh, uh, collapsible if you can, assault. If you, if you got to stay on the, this item. Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you. This Let's is... not be a uh, rover tonight, this morning. Um, I've been up all night. First of all, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to say why must we pay the LAPD over time? What, what we should do is hire more qualified police officers, i.e. military veterans, to serve and protect law-abiding people instead of paying overtime wages. It's the waste of money by paying overtime to tired and stressed out and burned out cops. Common sense would dictate hire fresh, intelligent individuals who have the zest and zeal to go out there and enforce the rule of law. And you can't overburden a lot of these cops because it's hard to be on the beat and work overtime. It's not fair to them, it's not fair to us, and it's not fair to the taxpayers. It makes no sense because the job doesn't get done. So again, city attorney, let's enforce the rule of law. God bless America. Thank you. Um, okay, so item six, no other cards. Um, and uh, not special, not called special by uh, any of my colleagues. We'll go ahead and accept that grant as well. Very good. And item 11, we do have one card. Item 11, Board of Fire Commission's report relative to a fire department memorandum of agreement with the California Fire and Rescue Training Authority. Mr. Ramirez? for the department's urban search and rescue team to conduct an operational exercise and mobilization. You wish to speak on item 11? Thank you very much. Um, I, was, I was very taken aback, um, ladies and gentlemen. I was taken aback by this wonderful article. This, is, this was in the LA Times, Monday, June 23, 2014. It's, um, it involves wonderful it, it, it was actually located in uh, Yarnell, Yarnell Hill in Arizona, where 19 fire, firefighters out of 20 men crew were killed in the Yarnell Hill fire last year. It is incredibly sad. It, it broke me. It, ter it just, it was sad. Look at all these brave souls. They're it doesn't relate to this item. So if you want to relate it back to this item, you but can. It's fire issues training, and it, it actually is. Because you've got number 11, and it talks about, again, the training authority in the amount, search and rescue team to conduct an operational exercise and mobilization. Okay? And again, um, these, that was your last these morning. fire department, again, we'll be asked to leave. fire department officials were, no. were, had been trained. They followed their procedures and training, and they were killed mm -hmm. in the midst of a fire because no air support was delivered. Again, it was a three-pronged problem. The training, no air support, choppers, and bad radios. They were, uh, the, the radios or the walkie-talkies, there was um, bad reception. So that's why 19 out of 20 mem members were killed. Thank you so much. And this is such a sad Okay, ma'am, your time. No. Your time is Thank up. Thank you. you. Let's not be so rude and nasty. Okay, another, another outburst after the clock, and you'll be asked to leave. Oh. Thank you. Who made you go? Okay, that was the last warning, so now you're asked to leave. So thank you so much. We'll see you in council, I'm sure. Thank you. The rest of your cards will be filed. Um, number 12, then. That was 11. Did you want to approve? 11. Uh, we'll go ahead and approve that as well. Thank you. Without objection, that'll be the order. And now I believe... Um, is Mr. Koretz is here? Okay, and ready? So we'll go ahead and take item 8. We do have two cards on item 8. Did you wish to speak first, Councilman? Thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Um, I thank the committee for hearing my motion this morning, and I'm here to speak personally because this is an issue that is important to me and my constituents and your constituents. Uh, as we all know, wildfires are frequently caused by people throwing out cigarettes carelessly out of their, window, their car windows or improperly discarding other burning materials um, in Southern California's very dry, brush-covered hillsides. And we know this often creates wildfires that can cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars 
uh, not to mention the, the risk of uh, injury or loss of life. And given the, given the great danger and, uh, and cost to uh, our city and its residents, I think we have to get more serious about enforcing our existing municipal code provisions, penalizing people who discard burning items like cigarettes within our high-risk fire zones and our hillsides. And to that effect, my motion asks that the CAO and LAFD report back on the feasibility of imposing a $1,000 fine for anybody cited for smoking in a very high fire hazard severity zone. This fine will make it clear to all in Los Angeles that we take fire prevention extremely seriously and won't tolerate those who needlessly put the city's residents and firefighters at risk. Um, and although the LAFD has informed me they support a $1,000 fine for improperly disposing of burning material in a very high fire hazard severity zone, uh, they have expressed concerns about the ability to enforce the city's already existing ban on smoking in such zones. And with all due respect to the professional opinion of the LAFD, I believe it's of utmost importance that the city makes a clear statement that smoking in our dry, brush-covered hillsides won't be tolerated. I, I think it's ridiculous for us to send a message to our residents that we refuse to, endorse, to, to enforce this ban um, and smoking atop, atop uh, the tinder boxes that are our hillsides uh, during fire season. And while I understand that we can't catch every person who smokes in a hillside or canyon, I don't believe that eliminates our duty to enforce this ban. I understand there are concerns about selective enforcement, but I think we resolve that by not being selective. Anyone caught smoking or disposing of a cigarette in these areas should face enforcement. Um, installing more no smoking signs in our very high fire hazard severity zones will send a clear message, especially, especially if the sign communicates the threat of a fine up to $1,000. I think we may also want to consider making these offenses a part of our new ACE program so that the first violation would be 250, the second 500, and the third 1,000. But I think that wouldn't stop our signage from uh, uh, noting that a, a fine could be up to $1,000. Uh, suggested, one suggested alternative sign stating that it is illegal to improperly dispose of burning material in a very high fire hazard severity zone I believe would be incomprehensible and wouldn't work. Uh, I've seen a better version of that where it's, it's depicted. Um, I still think it's confusing, I, but, but I think better than, than other possibilities in that direction. I think it's, it's much better if we just do the, the simpler no smoking in hillsides and uh, in, in smaller print and note that they could face a $1,000 fine. Um, I'd also like to request that the LAFD and DOT address in their report back the installation of new signage needed to enforce any new regulations. And I'd like to ask, if possible, that the report comes back in 60 days. So I appreciate your consideration. Um, I think we definitely need to take stronger action than we've taken in the past to protect our, our endangered areas, especially as we face drier and drier conditions as uh, the drought worsens and we face uh, greater temperatures due to climate change. So I thank you all very Great. much. Oh, thank you very much. We have a couple of comment cards as well, and then we'll ask the department okay. to come up. But if you have any questions. Or yeah, oh, I want to thank Mr. Koretz for bringing forth the motion. Uh, he and I uh, share districts with similar geography and, and similar high fire risk. Uh, for me, Brentwood and Pacific Palisades, uh, totally understand the rationale behind the, the, the motion and support it. I'd also like staff, when they report back, uh, uh, to, to give us some recommendations on what the appropriate enforcement agency should be. Uh, but also to have staff uh, consult with um, uh, the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy uh, and, and, the, and the State and, and National Park Service to uh, determine what best practices they've used to, to, to do enforcement. Uh, a lot of the, the area that, that, that we have are, are streets that go up against somebody else's uh, 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 Parkland that they manage uh, on our behalf, uh, which is the, the greatest fire risk. And so getting their perspective on it would probably be uh, useful as well. Yeah, that's a great idea, especially uh, the Conservancy has properties scattered throughout. Yep. So 
ideally we could adopt similar approach. And if they have uh, if they have staff in the area that are staffing those places, are are they uh, empowered to to help us enforce this, or is it only LA personnel who can enforce it? Mr. Fair. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Paul, for this motion. There are high fire danger zones across the city, northeast Los Angeles, uh, adjacent to Allegiant Park, Griffith Park, et cetera. And what I would like to know from maybe the fire department, if you could, what's the difference between very high fire severity and, and fire danger zones? Because there's high fire danger zones throughout the hills of Echo Park, Silver Lake, et cetera. If I could ask the fire department to, to distinguish between those two. Okay, I can add that. Definitions. Report back as well. That, that, okay, to report back, that would be great. Um, I think this is a great motion, and I would like to report back, including those areas that may not be under the category of very high fire severity, because at times of the year, many times of the year, they are. Uh, and where I live in Glasshall Park, I overlook, uh, I can see the canyon across the way that has um, several dozen acres of open space, and occasionally, uh, there will be a party that starts over there with drinking and smoking and everything else. So I always uh, watch with great concern that something might go up there because that's another high fire danger zone. So uh, I would love to have those areas included in this report. Great. Thank you. Great. No, thank you very much. Um, I, too, would like to thank you, Mr. Kretz. Um, we have uh, a number of high fire severity zones, certainly in the 12th district, in fact, uh, we have our annual fires there. We've been through many evacuations and uh, uh, one of the highest areas, quite frankly, in, in the city. Um, it's one of the hottest areas as well in the, in the valley and uh, throughout the city. And there's a lot of fuel and a lot of dry brush. Um, and so I want to thank you for that. I have a question for you. Um, you limited this to and focused on smoking. Um, and I'm not sure if you also are interested in looking at any open flame, open fire situation as well. We have a lot of people that, um, uh, that have, that'll cook on an open stove or camp out in some of these areas, particularly the hillsides in my district, um, that have been known to uh, start a fire as well. We've had some of those issues in Griffith Park and it wasn't just smoking. And so I don't know if, I don't want to bog it down or, you know, um, if, if there are, uh, Ways to oh, I'm, I'm open to including all okay, of these. I think the, the, my main focus on it was obviously driving in the canyons because I don't think we do a great job of signage. I don't think we do a, a as good as that even job of enforcement. So I think it's, it's time we took that on. But uh, I don't want to limit it to that. Okay. Um, I don't know that the signage in the canyons needs to it attempt to address all of it though so it may be that there are places where this tends to occur more often and we might have signage that's more specific in in those areas i haven't really thought this piece through because it wasn't so if necessarily it's, my focus but i'm happy to add that and, so if and it said, broaden if it said something to the uh, effect of, of open flame flammable material or smoking type of thing so we can capture um cause and effect of what's we look back at historically what has caused a lot of these fires it's been all of those um so okay well we'll ask the department to report back on those things too i wanted to see if you're open right. to that so i appreciate it and this is very thoughtful so with that if we could bring up the fire department uh i believe this chief storms yeah thank you excellent no thank you very much and we've got a couple comment cards we'll get to in a moment as well uh chief we are going to ask for uh, a report back but um wanted you to weigh in on first and uh, give us your thoughts. Well, well, first, uh, Mark Storms, fire marshal. Um, I oversee the, the brush unit that, you know, is in charge of the very high severity zone. And part of uh, Council Member Kretz's discussion pointed out some of the problems we have where we've changed from the mountain fire district to the danger zone to the buffer zone and now the very high severity zone. And so you see different terminology in different places and different codes and different ordinances. This needs to be addressed now that we've adopted the new state fire code uh, effective January 1st with the, the 230 pages of amendments, it's a perfect time when we order signs, uh, working with Councilman Cedillo, Councilman Coretz, you know, and actually it affects 12 council districts. 
So I think that a coalition approach to this is, is an outstanding way to go with it. I've talked to numerous council offices over the last couple of days, and the time to order signage is, is now. The time to, to discuss the implementation of where we want the signs is now. And I want to thank uh, both council members for bringing this to the forefront. You know, the timing is, is excellent. Obviously, in the, with the, the fiscal issues and working with DOT, having lived through the red, uh, the, uh, the red flag no parking program and working with DOT intimately with that and the cost of signage and where to install the signs, we've got that. Both J Chief Vitovich and myself have experience in area, so it's perfect uh, timing. He's the assistant fire marshal we can work with all the council offices to move forward with this and make it any necessary recommendations for ordinance changes and adjustment to make it enforceable for whoever ends up with the enforcement responsibility. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple cards, unless my colleagues have questions specifically for the department. Just, just if you, since you're here. Yes, sir. The terminology, I'm kind of hung up on that because I know that like in zoning, for example, where they, they, it's not necessarily a park, but there, we have these open hillside areas. Um, as I mentioned, dozens of acres at a time, and they're ringed by housing, uh, residential neighborhoods. Those are considered high fire danger zones, but not necessarily very high fire severity zones. The, the terminology was adopted by the state of California, CAL FIRE, um, does a satellite assessment of the vegetation and the fire load of, of communities at risk. Uh, that is then, that map is then sent to us digitally and, and we've been indicated that that is now included in the very high severity zone. Now the thing that can affect that, obviously what we're seeing throughout the Santa Monica Mountains is a conversion from native vegetation to ornamental vegetation. But unfortunately a fire doesn't care who planted the pine tree. You know, Mother Nature or, or the, the person. So from the satellite, all they see is a vegetation and a fire load that is at risk. Mm -hmm. And that's how we, that's why we come to you to change and modify um, the very high severity zone every few years because it does change. Mm -hmm. the, the, the signage issue, the smoking, the discarding of burning materials is an enforcement issue. It's a signage issue. We've got signs that are, you know, we, obviously since we adopted a new fire code, all of our code numbers have changed. So luckily we don't have a big backlog of signs. We'll be ordering signs with the appropriate ordinances on them. So I think the timing is excellent. Wonderful. I, mean, I think it would be helpful to have those signs in these, uh, at these dead-end streets. They end up in the hillside areas that are somewhat remote sometimes mm -hmm. from uh, uh, visual, uh, uh, from sight, from right. the residences in the area. Right. To, to give the warning, uh, yeah. I think that would send a good signal. I, I spent four years in Hollywood working with the council members and the offices in that area, Hollywood Sign, Benedict Canyon, Laurel Canyon, all those, those areas that are prone to these type of issues. Homeowners associations concerned over visitors and, you know, and, and those issues are ongoing. And I think that this is a great time to have that discussion and figure out the, the location where the signs are needed, maybe the differentiation between park property and public lands. Right. I mean, public lands versus private lands. You know, and I think the, the, the timing of this uh, motion is excellent. Thank you. All right. Chief, thank you so much. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, Councilman Koretz actually asked for a 60-day, but there's been a number of things added to this. So um, I'd like to expand the report back, make it 90 days, and include the following. Um, the fire danger zones with the definitions and descriptions of the different types of zones and which ones would apply for these signs. That includes the uh, fire danger zones, the very high fire severity zones, and all the other categorical um, descriptions of what types of uh, vulnerabilities and zones are out there. It would also include in the report back um, the actual verbiage of signs and what would be su suggested by the department to look at and include not only the smoking issue, but open flame and or flammable materials. Uh, for the ordinance, that should include that as well. Um, the appropriate enforcement agency and who would be enforcing this and how. Um, to work in conjunction with and reach out to the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and get their input as well as state parks. And then also, uh, finally, to consider this as, um, as an ACE program. 
uh, with a rolling fine, the first one being 250, the second one 500, and the third 1,000, per Mr. Koretz's suggestion as well. And I think that captured. Okay. Thanks, so with that, um, that'll be the order without objection. Did you wish to continue the matter and hold the motion in count in committee? Uh, yes. Thank Come you, back sir. here in 90 days. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Um, no says, oh, actually, before we vote on that, I do have two cards. So, um, Tony Tusi, please, and a Skip Haynes, please come on up. Thank you for your patience. Thanks for coming up. Please add another minute. Thank two, you. Two minutes on these each. Um, I live in Laurel Canyon. I'm with Citizens for Los Angeles Wildlife. Normally, our purview is wildlife, but this is environment. I live exactly where the Laurel Canyon fire occurred in 1979. I was in that fire. My street burned. Um, Council Member Koretz has given you all the information. Last year, we asked the fire department about signage, and they basically told us budget restraints and so forth. So we asked them, if we get private property owners, can we put signs up? We put signs up. I have a sign. I want you to see this. These signs have been up for six months. Um, we have quantitative and qualitative evidence that they work. Uh, I need you in the microphone, sir. Microphone. Wow. These are the signs that we have up. Oh, thank you. These are the signs we have up in Laurel Canyon, Beechwood Canyon. All the communities are getting them from our uh, organization. They are community funded. We designed the signs, we changed them. This sign was made for near the Hollywood sign. The signs we have on Laurel Canyon Boulevard say canyons. We know that they work quantitatively and qualitatively because uh, the signs up in Beechwood Canyon had to be taken down for a weekend. And while the signs were up, four people were asked to put out cigarettes. When the signs were down, 37 people were asked to put out cigarettes. So we know these work, hmm. and we think that if you, as fast as this can be fast-tracked, it should be done. We've already talked with the city attorney's office. They've agreed to fast-track it once it's there, because fire is the number one clear and present danger for our city. So. This is what we're doing, and they, they work. And we'd be happy to work with the city on signage to do things. So um, we urge you to pass this and, and put it on. Thank you. Very much. Oh, thank you. That's thank very you. impressive. And I uh, appreciate you taking the proactive measure to do that. Those four people, um, let me just ask you a quick question. Did you ask them if they actually saw the sign? Uh, I didn't. OK. Park Rangers. Uh, just curious. Cadets. 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 Okay. okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, you're Skip, correct? Yes, I Okay. Thank you. Tony, did you want to add anything? Please, thank yes, you. Yes, I'd, like I'd like to add, add something. My name is Tony Tucci. I'm a director of CLA, and while we also, while we advocate for wildlife, our, our wild lands, our open space and parks, I'm also a member of Bear Beverly Crest Neighborhood Council, where um, we advocate for 27,000 uh, uh, stakeholders. And um, uh, 36 hours ago, we um, unanimously passed a motion to support this, a resolution, excuse me, to support this. And um, I've passed it out. Forgive me for our fax machines in the hills are just as old as our no smoking signs. So um, I hope that you will, you know, include this in your presentation. You know, we wrote that the greatest source of fire risk in Southern California is human-caused fires. Tens of thousands of commuters and residents drive through our territory each day. Smoking in a very high fire severity hazard zone violates the law, and a fire started by a smoker poses a significant danger to our community. And because our existing city signage and fines are currently not enough of a deterrent, we resolved to support this. I also wanted to mention that at that same meeting 36 hours ago, we, we uh, made a resolution to, or a motion, I would say, to ask uh, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy to add no smoking to their signs, which just basically are the brown signs that you see on their territory. Uh, we've actually posted some of those claw signs on, on their territory, and we feel they've been effective. Uh, one last comment. Um, some of the existing signs say no camping. And um, I'm not, per you know, this is me personally talking, I'm not really a fan of that. It, it's like the Smoky of the Bear, it promotes hanging out. And these are regions uh, where, where um, people are driving through. And that's why the focus on the fine 
and no smoking is, is I think, a, a really good solution. Thanks, you guys. No, thank you very much. Thanks for coming this morning. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, vote with those particular amendments. And uh, that'll be the order without objection. That'll be uh, unanimous. And we'll come back here in 90 days with that report back. Excellent. Thank you so much. I want to thank the uh, folks for coming out and their positive and proactive work on this as well. It's Mr. Koretz. Okay, with that, that should take us to um, item 12. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Item 12, motion, Price Buscayuno, requesting the city attorney to prepare an ordinance to regulate unattended charitable donation collection boxes. Uh, we have one card on item 12. Uh, Mr. Kelly. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Peter Kelly. I'm with the firm Vectus Strategies. We represent uh, a company called Planet Aid, which is a large international uh, operator of uncollected or of of, un, of, of clothing bin collections, and uh, uh, we are very much in favor of this regulation. The re- this is a thriving business. We have 20,000 bins throughout the United States, and we have 700 here in this in this city. We are removing almost 2,000 tons of, tr- of clothing that would otherwise be diverted to landfills in this city right now as we sit here. The reason the business is booming is that the public has an ever has an increasing appetite for wanting to be you know, wanting to recycle and reduce the load into our landfills. That having been said, uh, the business is new; it's still a little bit like the Wild West out there, and we are very much in favor of appropriate and responsible regulation. For example, no bins on on you know on public right of ways. You need the property owners, the property. Um, owner's um, consent, there needs to be identification on the boxes and what have you, and there needs to be a program worked out with the city, whereas people who aren't cooperating, uh, there's a remedy for, uh, for that. So the point is, we are very much in favor of the motion, and we are very much in favor of the regulation of the clothing collection bin business. Thank you. Great. No, thank you very much. And uh, that's our only card. Um, can we ask the city attorney to come up on this as well? We have the city. Chair, I don't think there's anyone from our office being that this was just a motion. Okay. Um, well, did, do any of my colleagues wish to speak on this? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I'll just say a few words on this. Um, there's a proliferation of these boxes um, from a lot of companies that uh, are, le- are legitimate and uh, may not be legitimate. Um, they are putting them on the public right away, they're putting them on private property without permission, they're putting them between. Um, in very obscure places um, uh, where they're very difficult to enforce because they could be on a flood control channel and people aren't necessarily sure who the property owner is or who to contact. Um, When you see one box, you suddenly see two or three other companies put them up um, in the middle of the night and you just see them the next day. Uh, Many of these are not maintained and uh, uh, clothing and other discarded bulky items end up adjacent to them as well. Uh, There has not been a lot of enforcement on these, and um, they're a nuisance. Um, So I absolutely support moving forward on an ordinance to regulate these. Uh, And uh, with that, uh, move forward to ask the city attorney to draft an ordinance um, as suggested in the summary. Um, I'd like specifically in that draft <clears throat> the unintended box placements that require the permit, appropriate department would establish a fee for the placement of these bins. I'd like to see a city permit sticker uh, with a permit number affixed to every box that has a permit so we can quickly identify what are licensed and not licensed. Um, the written express permission from the property owner shall be on file with the city to obtain the permit as well. Um, and it should be an annual permit not a one-time permit with an annual fee. Um, The boxes should also have uh, a current phone number uh, that's clearly fixed to the box permanently or painted on the box with a current phone number of the uh, service provider. 
and I'd like that to come back to um, this committee with a draft ordinance in 30 days. It's also going back to Public Works. I, I, I know that they um, postponed it for information to come back, so I'd like to add those elements to it. So it should come back to this committee and with that draft also come back to Public Works. Mr. President, did you mention maintenance as well and dealing with, with the boxes when they overflow? I did not. Maybe we could add that too. And uh, yeah, can you, if we could, be a little more specific? Okay, uh, just general maintenance in relation to if they're vandalized with graffiti, stickers, tags, etc., and then to address the overflowing um, of them uh, somehow, maybe post a regular, regularly scheduled maintenance schedule um, on the box. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go ahead and add those items, and that includes also the other um, regulated suggestions that are set forth and uh, the requirements that were presented. Okay, that'll be the order without objection. Excellent, thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Peter, for coming as well. Okay, that takes us to, I believe, item 13. Item 13, communications from the city attorney and ordinances adding a new Article 6.7 to Chapter 4 of the LAMC, declaring any large capacity magazine subject to Section 32390 of the California Penal Code to be a public nuisance and an immediate threat to the public health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of Los Angeles, and setting forth, as provided in state law, that large capacity magazines shall be subject to confiscation and summary destruction and disposed of in accordance with the provisions of sections 18010 and 18005 of the California Penal Code. All right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Council Members, uh, Deputy City Attorney Brian Satelli. Um, I want to bring to your attention our office transmitted a second revised draft ordinance yesterday and filed it. Uh, it's going to be in lieu of the previous uh, revised draft ordinance that you just mentioned concerning nuisance theory. We've uh, reconsidered the approach primarily uh, two cities, San Francisco and Sunnyville, enacted ordinances uh, which we modeled this particular ordinance after which would be a simple ban of possession of uh, LCMs, or large capacity magazines. Both the Sunnyville and the City of San Francisco's ordinances have withstand Second Amendment challenges uh, recently. Uh, the Sunnyville ordinance is currently uh, pending in the Ninth Circuit. We probably won't have a resolution until probably 2016. However, uh, we decided to take that approach to, from those two cities. Um, it clearly enu uh, enumerates the exceptions uh, which provide uh, for lawful possession if there be uh, large capacity magazines, which I, I know the council had asked us to do at the previous uh, council meetings. Um, so what you have in front of you is the uh, second revised draft um, along with uh, pages, several pages of findings which the council could consider. Um, it also makes it a misdemeanor to possess these and it allows 60 days uh, for people that have them to um, either um, dispose of them or, or give them to the police department. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, turn it over to my colleagues for any inputs, comments, or questions, suggestions. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm glad to see this before us, and I thank you for your work on this. There is, a, there is an epidemic of death and gun violence in this country, and it happens so often that it isn't even the top story on the news anymore. So I'm happy to, to see us... Uh, move forward on any legislation that can help crack down on that. I'm glad for your findings because it reminds us of Columbine and of Sandy Hook and of Aurora, Colorado, uh, of Tucson, Arizona and Gabby Giffords, of the uh, North Valley Jewish Community Center, uh, of the B&A in North Hollywood, of the shooting in Santa Monica College last summer, and oh yeah, uh, the murder of a TSA agent at LAX last fall. Um, I'm, I've gotten a lot of email urging me to oppose this. I'm absolutely unmoved by those emails. This is about preventing murder in our neighborhoods, um, preventing death in the streets, and about preventing the bloodshed of children. So I am absolutely in favor of this um, and would like to see us move forward. 
I, I would also like to thank you for your work. No one could have said it better than Mike just did. And, and thanks for having the, the wisdom to, to look at Sunnyvale and San Francisco to make sure it would withstand a legal challenge uh, and, and enhance uh, the, the chances of this uh, you know, becoming law and uh, being uh, unchallengeable. So it's, it's a huge step in the right direction. So thank you for your work. Okay, thank you. And uh, with that, um, let me just add my own comments and just maybe um, some questions as well. Um, I couldn't agree more. As my family is a victim of violent crime and uh, and uh, murder from uh, from a gun as well. And as a police officer myself, as a reserve officer, and the ability to carry high capacity for law enforcement is critically important. And so I want to distinguish between the two. Yep. Um, and uh, it has its place. Um, and the place is not to get rid of them entirely. It's law enforcement. Um, it's a critical component and tool for all law enforcement. And so I want to make sure, and I brought that up last time, uh, just a little bit, um, and that's why you've come back with other exceptions. And, and I realize that one of these issues are also pending in a court of appeals. Not sure where things are going to go. Um, I want to thank the police department as well as... Um, my colleagues for bringing this forward, as well as the city attorney's office, extensive work on this. This is a very delicate issue for so many reasons to so many people. Um, not only the, um, uh, the folks that um, are pushing, and I got a lot of emails and phone calls as well, um, as you can imagine as the chair of the committee, probably a few more, I don't know, I'm I comparing. Um, but, um, but with that, I looked at them all and I really looked through a lot of the details and the questions and the concerns and what some of the folks uh, were, were saying and um, sort of dismiss the ones that think it's, you know, want to go to an open carry situation here and some of the ones that think that every single individual um, at birth should be given a weapon um, and a gun and, and, you know, sort of dismiss some of those to look through and do a little bit of research on my own. Um, and come, came up with a few questions, and I, this is absolutely nowhere near um, comparing this from the uh, situations and the incidents that continue each and every day in this country and the ones that um, Mr. Bonnet uh, brought up in his opening comments as well. Um, but what it does just vaguely remind me of, and, and it's, it's, again, nowhere near similar at all, um, but as a comparison to taking something that was manufactured or, um, uh, and widely distributed and, and possessed um, to regulating something uh, to a current time and how did we deal with that in the past in the state. And one of the things that came to mind was the classic car example of seatbelts. Now again, not murdering people, not you know, folks that are mental ill that get their hands on these and commit these kinds of crimes um, but certainly a lot of people were dying in traffic collisions and there was a lot of issues about, you know, seat belts and, and a lot of discussion back in that time, 1989, on classic cars. So what we did then in the state of California um, is we went by the date of the manufacturer and said um, you wouldn't have to retroactively um, purchase and install a restraint system on a classic car. And again, not similar at all but looking at, and not an issue of fairness, and not an issue of, um, I'm just looking for what is really feasible as well. Um, so the question I have is, um, right now we have um, when, uh, I believe, when it was, if it was when, when it was purchased, so purchased before the year 2000, rather than a manufacturer date. And um, I'm looking at not so much ownership as much as collectors and hobbyists, and how to figure out if there's some way to uh, break out that niche of collectors, hobbyists. I've heard from a lot of, a lot of um, police officers and retired officers who are collectors and hobbyists, and also uh, competitors, those who actually compete if they're in competitions, um, and if there's some way of permitting uh, we do have in the ordinance, we have a breakout and exception for museums and those types of professional collectors where they're on display 
secured and unloaded. So I, I think you did a great job in, 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 in breaking those things out. My question is, is there a way or another uh, municipality that has had the ability to figure out uh, for those who are either collectors or hobbyists or, or you know, uh, that, that are professional uh, competition um, uh, shooters, that um, that possession issue, um, if there's a way to drill down into that and figure out how we can capture that and have those few allowances, um, whether it be by licensed or otherwise. If it were statewide, it would be a lot easier, but since we're focused on just the city, um, we've got to see if there's a way to, to, uh, to get some of those answers back to the people that have asked me. I said I would look into that. Um, and I don't want to hold this up. The other uh, question I had Um, well, let's go ahead and go through those first. If, did you guys look at those issues? Yeah. Uh, one of the questions, uh, one of the concerns I may have based on your question, uh, council member, is that it's very difficult to determine when they were manufactured because large capacity magazines, and I'll defer to the department on this, are not marked or serial numbered. So the only way to determine, I guess, would be a bill of sale of when they purchased it because they're not clearly identified like a, like a firearm. But well, I'm talking about the firearm itself, not the city attorney's correct on the magazine. Um, it is hard to tell when it was manufactured. I'm sorry, Detective Tompkins, LAPD gun unit. Um, there is no numbers or serial numbers like a firearm on a, on a magazine. Um, so it could have been manufactured two days ago or, or 15 years ago. And a lot of them hold their condition, so it is extremely hard to tell. There is one built in exception, Council Member, under provision 13, um, page 7 under the exceptions under subdivision C. If there's a firearm that has, is unique in nature and that it only holds a, a magazine that has more than 10 types of bullets, then there would an exemption for allow that type of magazine to be permissible. So like the antique gun, right. it only holds more than 10. So I was looking at that, and under 13, for example, um, it says that the fire the person obtained prior to that it's right. rather than manufactured prior to. So if we're talking about classic guns, and again, you're talking about really a collector. Yes. And the situations that had been mentioned in these specific incidents weren't classic guns. These were high capacity uh, magazines as well as and or um, uh, other types of, of uh, semi-automatic weaponry and also automatic guns. Um, right. So this is, again, a very niche market, but it's a big market. Um, and it's not one. And it, from from the experience in talking to the the police department, these aren't the ones that necessarily we've had any really issues with in society um, or here locally. The classic gun collectors, as you, if you will. That's correct, sir. Okay. So with that, um, the the real question is: it says obtained prior to 2000. Right. It's then the burden of proof is to the collector to show when they might have obtained it, rather than a manufacture date prior to. Right. It, the date is important because under the penal code, under 32310, it prohibits the manufacture of a large capacity magazine after 2000. It's silent as to possession. So, in, yeah, in going into that, is can you come back with um, perhaps there's a way to narrow in on if there's particular types, either a list of, of those guns or if there's a manufacture date where they were prohibited from not, not they, they were prohibited from uh, uh, solely having high capacity magazines manufactured for that type of gun. Does that make sense? Yes, I believe so, sir. The, some of these guns that we're talking about again, the manufacturer is no longer available, and nobody is making a magazine for that specific gun. Um, and to do so would probably reduce the value of the gun. So that's what we're talking about. So I would imagine. It's not a long list of firearms that fall into that category. Um, but we can always tell when that firearm was manufactured through ATF um, or through the actual manufacturer. So we can verify the date that that gun was manufactured. And most likely, if it's here in the state of California, tell when it was sold to the person here in the state of California. So we can come up with an actual date. So if we can go back to the actual weapon itself rather than the, um, than the magazine the possession date of, the, of a magazine, because in many cases it may be virtually impossible for somebody to prove, um, then I think it would 
have a little more clarity. And that, that, that was what some of the questions that I, that I was asked to, uh, to bring forth, so, so that I said I would, because I do want to move this forward. Um, Mr. With, Chair, I have a yes. question on that. How would we define collector or hobbyist? That's when what I wanted to get into next. Um, so a collector, enthusiast, ho a hobbyist, and or um, a competitor. How could we, and has any other jurisdiction, have we looked into any other jurisdiction looking at a way to permit those? I'll defer back to uh, City Attorney Brian Stelly. I'm not aware of anything. And again, um, the ATF and the state of California will issue a uh, curio and relic license to a person that's usually a collector or, or um, of old firearms or anything over 50 years of age. Um, they do have a permit from both agencies, so that could be something that we could look at. Okay. So there is a permitting process for those? For, for the curio and relic. Not for so much for the enthusiast or the, uh, the, um, the sportsman or whatever, but for a uh, curio and relic collector, they need both a federal permit and a uh, city permit. It, I, I'm sorry, a state permit. If it were something like that ATF thing, where it's a, a curio or something like that, then I might be uh, open to it. I'd be really reluctant to, to open up a broader exemption just for collectors, hobbyists, enthusiasts. As that's why I wanted to dive into what exists now. Not recreating, not right. establishing a first ever, but if there is some type of um, way for these folks that are truly collectors, that are, you know, um, uh, those are not the ones we're, you know, really trying to target again. These aren't the ones we've ever had issues with. But, uh, in looking at that, if you can come back with what, what permits are out there, um, how they would be accessed by the public, accessed by, by the public, that of these particular, of collectors, we'll keep it on collectors, um, rather than enthusiasts or hobbyists. And then um, that last category of, of competitors. Um, can you address that at all? How, how could they be identified if they are, um, you know, um, I won't say professional competitors because I don't know what that would mean, but um, that they regularly um, compete. And we got a number of uh, examples of those that were sent to us as well. Can you address all those? I know we have competitions in LAPD. Law enforcement yes. has its yes. own competitions. We have numerous awards um, yes. that LAPD has won. And uh, if you go to any of the ranges, in fact, there are flags flying um, and affixed to the wall of the names of officers who win competitions year in and year out, uh, something that we're very proud of in LAPD uh, and in law enforcement. There are a number of private competitors as well, and uh, so they would fall into, uh, and, 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 and under the competition uh, for law enforcement that has their own competitions, the high-capacity magazines that are used in competitions aren't for a law enforcement purpose. They're for a competition purpose. So how do we distinguish to those who are other types of com competitors? Is there any type of ATF um, permitting or any, anything else that exists out there to identify those individuals? Yeah, I can't think of any right now. I will speak with um, City Attorney Brian Sully, Sotelli, and we'll, we'll figure out something. Okay. I do realize, though, um, a couple of the guys that I do work with are in the, um, the shooting um, competitions, and I do believe most of them are going to 10 rounds or less. Um, so maybe it won't be that much of an issue in the future. Um, I do know that high cap magazines are out there, but the, um, most of them are going to the 10 rounds so that the new generation coming in can participate in those shooting competitions. I've, I've gotten some, some folks have reached out to me from LAPD that are competitors and said that they're fine because they're law enforcement so they right. can possess them anyway. And, and that means possessed locked up in their own home would still be illegal under this if they weren't law enforcement. But they said they have friends they compete with as well. And under some situations there are those. So, how, so they've asked me to look into that as well. Or they have family members that are also competitors. Um, so if we can look into, again, not a big, widespread um, net that we're trying to cast. Um, this is a very niche, small, um, professional uh, group of, of um, upstanding citizens that we're just not trying to throw everybody in, into the pool on this, but, but mostly everybody, where it would make sense. Captain Hearn, uh, commanding officer for gang and narcotics division. We, we can look into it. Uh, we didn't research that spe specific angle, but it, okay. it certainly is a valid concern uh, that, that should be contained within the ordinance. 
um, and then we can we can move forward after we, we narrow down the definition um, and also look at what the other, other jurisdictions have done um, when they have their ordinance because they would have the same issues as well. Not to hold this up, how long would it take to come back to research some of these things? I know you guys are busy on a lot of other things, but we're very interested in moving this along. And I don't want to give it an appearance that we're at all holding this up, but I I think the I think information is critically important, particularly since we know, without a doubt, it's probably going to be challenged, number one. And number two, um, we still have an appellate case on where this was copied pending in the court. So to capture some of the other issues that have been brought up that we know are going to be challenged, and if we can capture those to ensure that you know, we've addressed those as well with still trying to make this safety issue move forward, what would be your time frame? I think. Well, yeah, I would say some of the stuff will be simple. The uh, the ATF or the federal laws with the CNR will be able to address rather quickly. Uh, the competition, you know, again, uh, the sportsmen. Uh, uh, I'll leave it up to Brian. Um, I'm sorry, Satelli. Some of these issues are very complicated and very sensitive, so I would probably encourage a longer period, a little longer period of time, so we could research it. And so. I leave that to you. Tell me what it is. Two weeks, three weeks, a month, 90 days, 60 days. I mean, you tell me. You know your workload. And At least 30 days, I would say. Yeah. Can we say no more than 30 days? Uh, and why, don't we, why don't we do this? We'll say, we'll say 30 days, and if you need more time at that time or you can let us know where you're at, you can check in with my office prior to us putting it on an agenda and let us know that maybe you'll be ready. Uh, and I just want to put it on the record, I'm, I'm, I'm not myself as interested in the exemption for the, the sportsman or, or the, the, the competitive shooting. I understand it's a, it's a thing. Uh, we don't want to throw everybody in the pool. I'm more comfortable getting more people wet, uh, <laughs> frankly. Uh, I, 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 I don't know that somebody needs more than 10 rounds to, to do the, the, the competitive thing. I'm actually afraid that opens up a, a loophole that, that other people might get in through, so uh, uh, not as much of an issue for me. Okay. Um, we do, before we, um, we vote on that, I believe we have some speaker cards as well. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank I you. really appreciate that. Um, two speaker cards, Mike Hanna and Chad. Mike and Chad. Morning. I'm Michael Hanna. Nice to meet you. Thank you for coming up. Appreciate it. I appreciate it, too. Is anyone here supporting the Second Amendment? Yeah, sir, if you can only address the uh, us. As so what I brought with me today is a disassembled legal California high-capacity magazine. And I brought it here because I'm not sure if many of you have seen this, and you know how simple it is to manufacture these from a piece of metal. You can look right through it, just the box. You have a metal floor plate that can also be plastic. You have a piece of plastic on top the magnet that the cartridges follow. And then you have a basic spring. This box, this piece of plastic, this piece of metal here is what you're trying to ban and what you're trying to say that the next mass shooter is coming from a legally possessing Californian. And I take extreme offense to that. Um, to think that a mass shooter, someone sick enough to commit a crime in the public, would care about a misdemeanor and would go and turn in their magazines or would stop themselves from going to the rest of California, getting one of the millions of these that exist, going to one of the 40 states that they sell these in, getting one of these that exist and coming back. It's just futile, and I don't understand why your energy is spent on law-abiding Californians, people who are here in front of the city saying, look, I own one of these, this is a piece of metal and there's nothing wrong with it. And I hear being compared to Sandy Hook and Columbine but I don't hear anything about Sandy Hook voting armed guards in schools to respond to these threats after the Sandy Hook shooting. You know, I don't hear about Elliot Rogers, who had 40 California-compliant handgun magazines with him, who killed three people with a knife and ran people down with a car. I did hear the car analogy, though, and I'd like to compare it more to limiting the gas tank and limiting the speed a car can drive than making people wear seatbelts, because that's what this is. It's telling people the state will only let you have a car that can go 10 miles an hour, and it's just forgetting about people who can modify their engine to go more than 10 miles an hour. It saddens me that there's police officers here that don't seem to know what they're talking about when it comes to guns, including the city attorney, who on the first day of law school, I'm a lawyer, we learned that you're not supposed to use cases that haven't even been appealed yet, and he's sitting up here talking to you about FIOC 
and all the other cases on the record. It doesn't make any sense at all to me. Thank you. So I just want some compassion, and I wish you'd let an actual person who shot guns before okay. talk to you and educate you on the truths and statistics about okay. guns. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Thanks for coming here, Mike. Chad? Can I ask you one thing? Uh, I, I, $400 for you. Yeah, your, your, your time is up. And, and since I've warned the others, I've got I to really stick to the time. But thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, honorable members of the committee, thank you for allowing me the time to speak on this issue. Uh, my name is Chad Chung, and I sit on the board of directors of the Calgun Shooting Sports Association. Uh, together with our sister, uh, our sister organization, Calguns.net, we have 185,000 members in the state of California. <clears throat> As you may already know, it's illegal to uh, import, manufacture, or sell a high-capacity magazine. It's also recently, as of January 1st, it's illegal to import parts to rebuild those magazines. So, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> yeah. Take your time. Um, so, I mean, the, the, diminish, the, the, the amount of magazines that are out there are, are diminishing, but there are people that acquired them before the ban of 2000, um, and I don't think that they should arbitrarily be turned into criminals overnight. Today, I sit before you and I'm innocent. Tomorrow, if you pass this ordinance, I will be, I'll be breaking the law. Uh, so I have a choice to either move out of Mr. Englander's district, or I have a choice of turning in my lawfully owned property and receiving no compensation. Um, I just think that the, the ordinance, as it's currently written, puts an undue burden on competitive shooters like myself, hobbyists, people that enjoy the shooting sports. Um, and I just think that there needs to be a little bit more diligence put into, put into the process before something is passed. Um, I reserve my time for any questions. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, so without objection, we'll go ahead and uh, bring it back, address those particular issues. Um, those were some of the issues that uh, the speakers brought up as well and appreciate you coming here this morning. Um, it is very sensitive, very complicated, um, and, uh, and I want to thank again uh, my colleagues and the mover of the motion, uh, because I think it is something incredibly important to address as quickly as possible. So we'll go ahead and do that. Um, I believe that concludes all the agenda Mr. items. Yes. Reports to come back to public safety. To public safety, correct. Um, with that, we have general public comment. We have two cards for general public comment. And Tony Ramirez, she's going to we'll file her card. She was asked to leave. She was disrupting the meeting. She was warned on three different occasions. She's been warned prior to that on many occasions um, that outbursts outside of public comment are incredibly disruptive. And so I want to note that for the record. Um, she was also um, off topic uh, on the ones that she was speaking on um, as a frequent public speaker. Um, she knows the rules well because she is told not only in committee but in council to stay on topic um, and, uh, uh, and the outbursts. And so that is not new information. It was reminded to her again uh, three times during this particular meeting. So we'll go ahead and note that it was disrupting the meeting, which is why she was asked to leave uh, per the rules. With that, um, Mr. Herman has been incredibly patient. And I thank you so much. Come on up for your general public comment. And uh, we'll give you your full two minutes as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'd like to comment on item 13. Um, item 13, uh, you can't comment on general, general public comment. General sir. public comment can't be on anything that was okay. on and the I'm agenda. And I'm going to refer to the exemption of people who would wish and contain in possession a clip. As the law points out, based on the Supreme Court under Kennedy, Anthony, Thomas, Clarence, Powell, Lewis, F. Jr., under the federal courts, we have rights and laws under the Bill of Rights. And I'm not going any further than that. Now I'm going into my point. The nuisance and denial for seating for public interest in council chambers is a safety concern for me and others. We declare public a nuisance and violations of free speech to the public's welfare of all citizens to, to participate free speech in council chambers. Seating forth Violations of buffer zones and barriers by ropes is unconstitutional. Violation of the ADA and unpractice of your illegal habits, Mr. Englander, in programs based on services, activities, for you continue to violate my rights under ADA Section 504, Title I, 
Title II. The Department of Justice has said, under free speech, under the Supreme Court, a nuisance and safety of our First Amendment right, how dare you? And so, as I wear my Batman shirt for justice, and I speak on behalf of every Angelino and all you in Los Angeles, public comment today is going to be an event for Batman has come back and I do bring my mask and I do wear a new garment representing Los Angeles and LA Live. Thank you for your cooperation. Okay, that concludes um, general public comment. That uh, concludes the meeting agenda and we are adjourned. <laughs>